Well, I'm glad you had time to see me. You look so very slim, Lillian. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Ladies and gentlemen, Meryl Streep. Almost 40 years ago, you, Jane Fonda, like a big sister, walked me into movie making. I was 28, just out of drama school. I got my first movie, Fred Zinnemann's Julia. And I was so nervous because all my scenes were going to be with you. First day, they called me to the set and I met Jane Fonda for the first time. We rehearsed once, then we just started shooting. And it was kind of great. I didn't do exactly what I'd done in the rehearsal, but second take, I thought, well, I'll try something else. I'm feeling alive. I'm feeling really good here. And Jane she said to me, look over there, that green tape on the floor, that's your mark. And if you land on it, you will be in the light and you will be in the movie. <laughs> and I said, I love this woman. I'm sorry. Now, don't you, don't, don't make me go in there. Please, please don't make me go in there. Don't make me go in just, there. Well, just if you do, I swear, one day, next week, maybe next year, I don't know, I'll go right out the window. Dustin shocked me because we were shooting a scene. I want my son. What I'm makes you so sure he wants you? What makes you so sure he doesn't want me? My wine glass was sitting there in heat. And then... In, in another scene, he slapped me, and, you, and when I see the movie, I see the imprint of his hand on the thing, not in the take that they used, but I still see the hand from the previous take. I thought, ew, maybe this is the method or something. <laughs> I think he's very, very gifted. It wasn't the most fun I've ever had on a film. I came here to take my son home. <laughs> I love him very much. <laughs> and the winner is... Thank you, my dear. Welcome, my dear. Meryl Streep in Kramer <laughs> vs. Kramer. Holy mackerel. Uh, I'd like to thank Dustin Hoffman and Robert Benton, to whom I owe this. Acting is... Um, in this country, I think it's a lot like a sporting event. You know, there's a lot of competition, all these award ceremonies. They garner business. They garner, they get people to watch. They get people to go to the movies because they think they're going to see the winner. On the other hand, they're destructive to these very delicate things we have called egos. I knew it was ordained that I should never marry an equal, so I married Shane. It is my shame that has kept me alive, my knowing that I am truly not like other women. I am hardly human anymore. I am the French lieutenant's whore. Carol's particular gift was his delicacy. And so you never felt his hands on you as an actor, but he would just sort of gently lead you in a direction. But there was a moment in the filming where I did not give him what he wanted. And I was completely confounded because he wouldn't tell me what it was. You are a remarkable person, Miss Woodrow. Yes, I am a remarkable person. And I just couldn't say that to Carol's satisfaction. Probably because it was the thing I was least convinced of myself. I'm going to tell you something now I have never told anybody. I couldn't even read that scene, the scene of the choice. I read it once when we got the script, and I never read it again because I couldn't stand it. And I think I didn't do that because I was Sophie. I was in denial. I knew it was coming. I knew it was back there as Sophie, and it was something I never wanted to look at. Du kannst eins von den Kindern behalten. Das andere muss weg. Wollen Sie mir sagen, dass ich wählen muss? I thought I was screaming. I thought I was screaming as loud as I could. It was like being in a dream. 
And you realize that no sound is coming out later, but you, you really think you're screaming. And the winner is Marvelous Meryl Streep. Get that. My speech. No, it's just speech there. Okay. <laughs> Short speech. Uh, no matter how much you try to um, imagine what this is like, it's just so incredibly thrilling, right down to your toes. I'd like to thank William Styron for creating this beautiful character, and I thank you all very much. They're trying to kill me. They want me to stop what I'm doing. They contaminated me, you know that? I know. I'm internally contaminated now. Now you listen to me. We're gonna go to Los Alamos on Thursday. Oh. And get a full body count from some doctors know what the hell they're doing. All three of us. <clears throat> I'm so scared. It's difficult to find that niche which tells a, a true story about a fully dimensional woman and at the same time is screen worthy and going to bring people in. So that's what I like to do. That's total immersion into possibility what a life I could imagine I lived and uh, that's uh, infinitely interesting in 1977 I went to see a performance of the cherry orchard at Lincoln Center and that's the first time I saw Meryl I remember I was immediately struck by how unique she was how wonderful she was since then we've worked together three times but our first movie was the deer hunter it's about lifelong loyalty and friendship and Meryl you have my loyalty and friendship because you're a truly special person and a great actress. If you had time, we could have uh, lunch or something. Oh. Lunch? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, well, I don't know. I mean... You're very beautiful. Oh, God. I'm very married. I am too. Animus. I've been sent to ask if we may stand you a drink. Who is we? The members, actually. I'm more interested in Farah, Kinanjui, Kamante, and all the people that are behind the scenes than I am really in these rich colonialists. I have trouble with romanticizing that kind of an organization. Rose-lipped maidens, lightfoot lads. <laughs> yeah. Thinking it's so wonderful that she's allowed to go in and have a drink at the bar. Well, big fucking deal. Where's my lifeboat? He's fine! It was the last day of shooting, and this lion is supposed to be tethered. I'm whipping, using this bull whip, and I crack it near the lion. It was too far away for me to actually hurt him. And as long as it was tethered, it would sit there like this. And I would whip it. <laughs> You know, with fury, and it would go. So Sidney was tearing his hair out. This is the day before we're supposed to leave. We're all supposed to leave. He's had it. And he said to the DP, he said, cut the tether. The guy said, what are you talking about? You know, the money. He said, cut the tether. And for the last scene of that movie, when I whipped that line, she goes, Arr! she really ran at me. And I went, like this and then she ran away <laughs> the movie was over and I got on an airplane and came back to New York <laughs> I would have to ask any sane person whether they believe I would actually untie a lion and let it loose on my actress. I think that's a little bit of creative memory going on. She was very brave. She did get close to these lions, but the lions always had their trainers around, and we did everything we could to protect Meryl. I, I know about you and Thelma Rice. I know everything. It's all here. Shit. You didn't even have the decency to hide the evidence. You just threw it in a drawer. Hotels. Motels. Oh, shit. You couldn't even pay cash. Like a normal philanderer, you charged everything. I mean, look at this. Flowers. Look at all these flowers that you bought for her. 
And you occasionally brought me home a bunch of wilted zinnias. How can you do this? If I'm such a bitch, then tell me. The Mike Nichols set was a place that he himself never wanted to leave. He really knew what actors were capable of. He spotted talent, loved talent. Loved talent married to imagination. And if he saw that in a person, if you were cast in his movie, he expected you to bring everything you had. And he was pretty happy with everything <laughs> that he saw. I want you to know that I know you're scared. And that this is the place to handle it. I don't, I don't really understand how I almost died. That's not... That's ne never what I wanted to do. That's what we ask them to do, actors. We want them to channel murderers because we have murderous feelings and we want to see that played out. I mean, not to go too back into the ritual basis of the drama, but there is a need uh, for people to embody these unspeakables and unimaginables, un and uh, so that's the actor's job. Just didn't go in the tent. Did, did you go to university, Greg? Think I've got the baby! Yes. Under. You can drink it. God, no, please, God, no. I had a special task with this one because I was portraying someone whose life was still in litigation. So I had to be real, real accurate. With the other real people I've played, I've had a little more leeway. With Isaac Dennison and, and Karen Silkwood, I could put more of myself in. You say the blood on the parka must have come from the baby. Yes. When it was in the dog's mouth? Somewhere around that time. But what other time could it have come from the Look, baby? Look, Mr. Barker, I wasn't there. I can only go on the evidence of my own eyes. We're talking about my baby daughter. He has a very specific way of speaking, which is not necessarily the way that a lot of Australians talk. It's very, very nasal, and it's up in the nose, and she goes down all the time to make a point like that. You know, and it was really exact, so I had to get it right. I mean, I really sweat bullets trying to achieve it. How old would you guess I am? 38. Oh, 28. 3? 23. I am 71 years old. It stops the aging process dead in its tracks. Drink that potion, and you'll never grow even one day older. Bottoms up. A warning? My character, Madeline Ashton, is very evil. And it's not her own fault. She can't help it. The world and the way it is forces her to behave the way she does. Could you just not breathe? This is not like anything I'd ever, ever done, except maybe in drama school. You know, this is real, sort of hyperbolic. Anything goes. Just do it. This go wild. And he gave us that license, Zemeckis, and the material could stand it, so we just had a lot of fun. It's great to play a character that's just unrelentingly mean. Ah, yes! No! Oh, damn! This is ridiculous. We can't even inflict pain! Pain? I'll tell you about pain! I will not speak to you till you put your head on straight. Is this the biggest one, Mom? Well, the biggest one is Gauntlet. That's a five plus. That's off the scale. When do we do that one? <laughs> well, we don't do that one. I didn't think that the physical challenge would be as intense as it was. <laughs> Physically, I needed a lot of stamina and kind of courage that I haven't had to call up before. The challenge was to be able to read the water and understand how to move through it safely. I'm not out of date, am I? I've been picking flowers for a woman, a sign of appreciation. No, not at all. Except those are poisonous. 
I really understood who she was. It was a, a war bride in my neighborhood in New Jersey who lived up the street from us. And her name was Nucci, and her husband was a tall, blonde GI. And she would say, Chrissy, take out the garbage. <laughs> and I just was in love with her. I loved the way she talked and moved and spoke. I didn't know anything about Iowa. I just cared that it was America. I worked hard on imagining a physicality for her. And this is part of an actor's fun, is making sort of a full-bodied transformation. There's a sensuality about her, but it's protected. Oh. Clint and I obviously came from very different genres in film. So there's that attraction of opposites. That helps the magic potion. have the Halloween festival for the kids. We have Thanksgiving, a benefit for the older people. And then we have to decorate all the Christmas trees in the town square. One true thing was about this mother and daughter who have started at the opposite ends of the spectrum, come closer, in essence, to understanding each other and seeing each other. And sometimes extremity does that. Your dad always says, less is more. To me, more is more. It's about something every human being should know, which is wake up, smell the flowers, be here now, be in your life, and appreciate what you have. If I knew that you would be happy, I would close my eyes now, I would. It's so much easier to be happy, my love. It's so much easier to choose to love the things that you have. And you have so much. Instead of always yearning for what it is you're imagining you're missing. Your husband ran off with your best friend. That's right. I know this lady. She runs this elementary school. You'd have to be willing to relocate. Where is it? <laughs> Welcome to East Hall. You need violence? I have 50 violence. I'll put you down as a sub. Thank you very much. If you practice, you do get better. Where you can't really practice acting. It's sort of this ephemeral thing. It either happens or it doesn't. I mean, you can get ready before you come in, but it's not the same thing. It just happens or it doesn't in a moment. And so there was something uniquely satisfying in countering and playing an instrument. It was a different kind of artistic satisfaction for me. Well, that was pretty good. Why are you acting like that? Like what? Like nice. Well, don't you want a nice teacher? I already got nice teachers. You added some variety. Yeah. yeah. I take it all back. You stunk. Would you be angry if I died? If you died? I think I'm only staying alive to satisfy you. Well, so that is what we do. That is what people do. They stay alive for each other. For Clarissa, I think she feels her life took a turn to the extent that she may be living in her past a little bit. When very demanding people set the bar really high for themselves and their expectations of life and what it potentially could be. And if you get a glimpse of that at some moment in your life, you just don't want anything less. Mr. LaRoche, I'm Susan Orlean. I'm a writer for The New Yorker. It's a magazine that... I'm familiar with The New Yorker. He had incredible attention to detail, to the minutest nuance of a line reading, for instance. That I wasn't prepared for. I thought that because he's so young that he's going to wing it, he'd have great freedom. But this sort of, you know, really meticulous attention was thrilling. And for an actor, it's really thrilling to know somebody's hearing what you're doing. In its, you know, sort of subtlest degree. Oh, you fat piece of shit! He's Shut dead, up. you loser! Shut up! You ruined my Shut life, up. you Shut fat! Up. fat. Fuck. Fuck you, lady! You're just a lonely, old, desperate, pathetic drug addict! It's over. I want my life back. I want it back before it all got fucked up. I want to be a baby again. And the award goes to... Meryl Streep. <laughs> I 
I've just been nominated 789 times, and I was getting so settled over there for a long winter's nap. <laughs> so happy to have been able to work with this amazing group of youngsters over here in adaptation. It was just an amazing film, and I'm so glad. Adaptation was just a joy from beginning to end. I shot both of the films back to back, and the hours was very difficult. But this one, I landed in Southern California and sort of didn't stop smiling from the minute we started shooting. This is about my son and the future of this country. I am an optimist. I believe in the future. And people who do, the ones who make history instead Ellie. of just sitting around watching it, <clears throat> God, where are all the men anymore? My father, Tyler Prentice, never asked, is this okay? He just did what needed to be done. It's kind of like getting to play General George Patton, except I get to be a woman. That's a really unusual thing, to charge in and inspire the troops and energize the locker room with real passion and belief and all that. It's, it's an unusual opportunity. Make no mistake, the American people are terrified. They know something's coming. They can feel it. And we can either shovel them the same old sugar or we can arm them with a young, vibrant vice president. We can give them heat, energy, give them a war hero with heart, forged by enemy fire in the desert in the dark. There were very specific public personalities that I was inspired by in creating this character. I loved being someone so certain, because certainty is just so attractive in people. To me, it's a completely bogus position, because I'm listening to every side, but it's so nice not to have to listen to all the different sides, to be so clear and on your track and sure. It's a fabulous thing. I don't understand why it's so difficult to confirm an appointment. No, I'm so sorry, Miranda. I actually did the confirm last night. The of your incompetence do not interest me. Who's that? This is the part that's more fun to watch than it was to do. I was aware that it was supposed to be fun to play this kind of a villainous character, but I really wore the responsibility that she felt. You have no style or sense of fashion. I think that depends on what you're... No, no. That wasn't a question. Acting is a weird job because you don't really have a boss. You have people who think they're in charge of your talent, but when the camera's rolling, you can pretty much do what you want. <laughs> Something funny? You know, I'm still learning about this stuff. This stuff? Oh, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. You're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. I would go back to when I was waiting on tables to find the real taskmasters. People who are very, very demanding, and you didn't necessarily like them, but they were valuable in your life in terms of teaching you how to work hard. Miranda, hi. Look, I'm trying to get you a place, but no one is flying out because of the weather. Please, it's just, I don't know, drizzling. And the Golden Globe goes to Meryl Streep. Hey, thank you so much, I'm, I'm really thrilled. I think I've worked with everybody in the room. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> I just want to say the reason you could see The Devil Wears Prada is because it was playing on every uh, theater screen across America. And if you can't see Little Children or Pan's Labyrinth or The Queen or all these great movies that I've just seen, then you have to go down to your theater manager and ask him why. It's amazing how much you can get if you quietly, clearly, and authoritatively demand it. <laughs> That's all. This movie demonstrates that women are interesting and funny and passionate and physical, you know, even when they cross the uh, dreaded 50 line. I had no compulsions for one second. I couldn't believe that they wanted me to be in it, based on my body of work. <laughs> <laughs> I want you all to be alert. I am concerned about matters in St. Nicholas School. Academically? I was not inviting a guessing game, Sister Raymond. I felt that she was a woman of limited opportunity in her life, a smart woman of ambition that had been broken at 
certain places in her life. Father Flynn, he called Donald Miller to the rectory. So, it's happened. Why she is so alert to this particular sin interested me. And so I imagined for her a backstory that included some real pain and knowledge. But I think that her vocation was one of need. You have no right to step outside the church! I will step outside the church! If that's what needs to be done, though the door should shut behind me, I will do what needs to be done! No, I'm damned to hell! You should understand that, or you will mistake me. Shouldn't I find something to do? What is it that you really like to do? Eat. And we are so good I at it. Look at you. At it. Now, They're how growing good you in are. front of you. Julia Child didn't just have a passion for her husband or cooking. She had a passion for living. She had real, true joie de vivre. Sometimes we need these outsized messengers to deliver the goods to us. And she was one of those people whose character was as huge as what she was trying to say. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. I'm going to try to flip this thing over now, which is a rather daring thing to do. She's so vivid in everybody's mind. Her size, her shape, her voice, her laugh. It's so familiar to us. It sort of meant that my work was half done. I just had to live inside and discover what animated her inside of her and to find the private Julia. At least my own imagined one. Today, we will begin by learning to boil eggs. I was so hoping for something a little more advanced. But you are not an advanced cook. But I do know how to boil an egg. There is one other class, but you will not like it. It's for professional, which you will never be, I'm sure. <gasps> Bonjour! We will stand on principle or we will not stand at all. But Margaret, with all due respect, when one has been to war... With all due respect, sir, I have done battle every single day of my life. Margaret Thatcher really did break ground. She didn't have a problem with how to lead, and so men didn't have so much problem knowing how to follow. Your problem, some of you, is that you haven't got the courage for this fight. No, you haven't had to fight hard for anything. It's all been given to you. As a young woman, I remember in 79 when she was elected, we were all sort of secretly thrilled that there was now a female head of state. The right honorable gentleman knows that we had no choice but to close down the school. There were all these wonderful British actors. I think there were about 40 or 45 of them. And I was the only woman in the room, and I sort of had the feeling Margaret Thatcher must have had when she walked into the uh, Conservative Party. <laughs> Teachers cannot teach when there is no heating, no lighting in their classrooms. And I asked the right honorable gentleman, whose fault is that? No, Methinks the right honorable lady doth screech too much. <laughs> To sit in the hot seat, I can't even imagine. Just the opportunity to deal with the deep, buried discomfort that people still have with women in leadership positions. And so I, I was really, really interested. Gentlemen, shall we join the ladies? Thank you, thank you. I, <laughs> when they called my name, I had this feeling I could hear half of America going, oh no. Oh, come on, why her again, you know? But whatever. <laughs> When I turned 40, I was offered three witches within one year. And I thought, okay, this is the way my career is gonna go. <laughs> so I said no to playing witches, but then this came along and 
this witch is quite different. I was watching him crawl back over the wall when bang, crash, a lightning flash. And cut. Beautiful. You're unbelievable, Meryl. We are fighting for a time in which every little girl born into the world will have an equal chance with her brothers. Never underestimate the power we women have to define our own destinies. We do not want to be lawbreakers. We want to be lawmakers. There's a particular power in this film for women. Never surrender. Never give up the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, Meryl Streep. do this every year. <laughs> There's everybody I love in this room. I can't stand it. And I really want to thank some people who aren't here, not because they didn't want to be, but because they're in heaven. And um, without them, I, I wouldn't be able to make this silly speech. And so I want to thank my mother and my father. Just uh, the funniest and, and saddest and most musical and gorgeous, uh, weird, strong personalities who fought with each other for 60 years and taught me everything I know about drama. <laughs> I hope it's not the end. <laughs> Thank you very, very much.